Hi, everyone. My name is Yurina Yoshikawa, and I'll be your host for tonight's Reading Between the Lines with Jast. Uh, first of all, just a little uh, reminder, this session is being recorded. Uh, some of you might be watching this on YouTube at a later time, but uh, this session is not like a lecture. It's not just going to be me talking. I'm going to have some volunteers from this group uh, read some text out loud so that you're not just hearing my voice the whole time. And if you ever have a comment or question, please feel free to mute yourself and speak. And um, throughout the session, I will also be sharing my screen so that you could see the text. And uh, I will kind of go back and forth that way. But um, just letting you know this is going to be fun and interactive. And I hope you'll enjoy this as much as I enjoyed reading this book. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you to the Japan America Society of Tennessee for uh, allowing me to host this for uh, through your wonderful organization. Uh, I want to mention that this book was chosen because uh, in Nashville, we are having the Cherry Blossom Festival this Saturday, and this week is dubbed Japan Week. So there are several other events happening throughout the city that have to do with cherry blossoms or Japan in some way. And we're all the city is getting really excited uh, for this event. And, you know, this spring has come in Nashville. It is really warm. Um, my son and I, we were at a park just out in the sun and, you know, feeling the breeze. And I, this is the perfect time to have a cherry blossom fest. But in any case, uh, because we scheduled the session to be part of Japan Week, uh, they wanted me to choose a book that incorporated cherry blossoms in some way. And the first thing that came to mind was this book, mostly because the book cover, I can show you here if you don't have your own copy, uh, features cherry blossoms. And there is a beautiful scene that also um, has cherry blossoms uh, written into it that we'll take a look at during the session. But uh, I kept thinking, are there other books that incorporate cherry blossoms in some way? Um, thank you, Carol, who uh, during our little pre-discussion uh, mentioned another book um, called A Thousand Cherry Blossoms, which I'd never heard of before, but I'll definitely Google that later. But um, yeah, I'm always on the lookout for new novels. So if you ever find any that you really enjoyed or that you would like um, us to do for a future reading between the lines, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm available. I have a website. I have, you know, the socials. It'll be pretty easy to find me if you just put my name in there. So all that is to say, yeah, this book, um, I think, is perfect for many reasons. Not only does it feature cherry blossoms, uh, it is a very approachable, thin novel. I think if you are a, you know, a reader of literature, this is probably doable to read in a few days. Uh, it is um, not like some other books that are really heavy or have a lot of different elements to it that'll take you a long time. This is, um, this is a doable one. Um, but on top of that, it's just so beautifully written, as we'll see. And um, if you, again, if you are in Nashville, and I think Ginger will say more about this towards the end, but uh, please visit the Cherry Blossom Fest at Public Square Park this Saturday, April 15th. It'll go on all day from 9.30 to 5. So be sure to check that out. All right. Um, I'm going to dive right in. And uh, like I said, if anybody has any thoughts or questions, feel free to mute yourself and speak. While I'm sharing my screen, I might not be able to see you raise your hand. So that's why I ask you to do that. Um, all right. So uh, before we get into the text, I would like to just share with you some overview of the book and the author. So who is Yoko Ogawa? Ogawa Yoko. Um, she was born in 1962 in Okayama Prefecture, and she attended Waseda University in Tokyo, uh, which is where a lot of uh, successful contemporary writers went. Um, most notably, I, I think um, Haruki Murakami also attended Waseda and studied literature. Uh, this was a really interesting little factoid uh, from her biography. I'm just going to read it out loud. It says that when 
Yoko Ogawa married her husband, a steel company engineer. She quit her job as a medical university secretary and wrote while her husband was at work. Initially, she wrote only as a hobby, and her husband didn't realize she was a writer until her debut novel, The Breaking of the Butterfly, received a literary prize. Her novella, Pregnancy Diary, written in pre brief intervals when her son was a toddler, won the prestigious Ak Aktagawa Prize for Literature, thus cementing her reputation in Japan. So um, for anyone who is, uh, you know, um, who, who wants to, who, who, who dreams of being a writer, you know, but um, has other jobs or feels like they're just doing a hobby on the side. Well, Yoko Ogawa made it, <laughs> made it work. And it's pretty incredible that um, just in her very limited time to write, she was able to produce so much. Uh, since she established herself as a novelist, she has published over 50 books of nonfiction and fiction. She has won many awards within Japan and abroad, including the Oktagawa Prize, the American Book Award, and the International Booker Prize. Um, and this housekeeper and professor, this book in Japanese, it is called Hakase no Aishita Sushiki. So if you're uh, studying Japanese, you will note that the literal translation of that is the equation the professor loved. Um, this translator, his name is Steven Snyder. He is the go-to translator for, I believe, most of Yoko Ogawa's books. Uh, he decided to title it The Housekeeper and Professor, um, even though the original title doesn't mention the housekeeper at all, which is interesting. The, this book was originally published in Japan in 2003, and the English translation came out in 2009. And um, there is also a film adaptation of this book, if you're interested. Uh, under the Japanese title, um, uh, The Equation the Professor Loved, or I believe it's also dubbed The Professor and His Beloved Equation. So you can try Googling it different ways, but if you're interested in the film adaptation, the only thing that's different in the film, and I've seen that film just once, is that um, it's told from the perspective of the son when he's older and he becomes a math teacher and he's giving this lecture to his students about, um, about why he came to love math. And so the film is told from his perspective and it keeps going back and forth between his flashbacks and his present moment speaking to his students. Whereas the novel, um, it only, you know, is told from the housekeeper's perspective and the son remains young throughout. So that, but otherwise the film does stay extremely true to the material. Uh, there are pieces of dialogue that's really taken verbatim. So if you enjoy the book, um, you'll probably enjoy the film adaptation as well. And that was released in 2006 um, and featuring a lot of, um, famous Japanese actors. So if, if you are someone who watches a lot of Japanese TV and movies, you'll probably recognize those faces. All right. Um, before getting into the text, a uh, few other things to note. Uh, I want to say, yeah, and this is something I mentioned to some people who are hanging out on Zoom um, a few minutes before, but Yoko Ogawa's other books have also been translated into English you might recognize uh, The Diving Pool. This is three novellas. Actually, uh, The Pregnancy Diary, which is the one that I mentioned earlier, the one where she wrote when her son was a toddler, that's incorporated in The Diving Pool. These novellas are really dark. <laughs> and they're really, it's like psychological horror. And so if you're into that, and you know, with the same kind of beautiful, intricate prose, um, highly recommended, but a, quite a different um, tone than the book we're about to see. Um, that, that, that's the same with these other two too. And I, I think that's something that I noticed in her books is that a lot of the time she deals with really um, psychologically, sometimes traumatic or gritty or, um, you know, uh, a lot of the times I feel like she, even though the narrators are very matter of fact, they'll be talking about things that are, um, you know, a little violent or shocking. And um, Hotel Iris is another one. This is another short book 
but just thematically and you know it, I, I think uh, it's been a while since I read this, but I believe it deals with like a young girl and an older man and, you know, ick. <laughs> just, <laughs> you, I think you have to have a little bit of thick skin um, to get through it, but uh, it feels like an important feminist literature. The Memory P Police, this is the one that was um, nominated for the National Book Award here in America. And this translation came out in 20, 2019 or 2020. It was very recent. But um, this one, um, it's surrealist fiction. So from the very first page, she's putting you into this world uh, in which there is such a thing as the memory police, um, sort of similar to like thought police, but even more extreme. And it takes place in this little village on an island. And um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite scary in the, like a psychological sense, but it, it feels like the, you know, sort of like Kazuo Ishiguro, maybe. It, 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 it feels like the novel is trying to tap into some sort of collective anxiety about um, the way we're being governed or the way that we're just anxious about a lot of things. So I think this novel does a lot um, with that. But um, yeah, again, very different uh, from The Housekeeper and the Professor, which personally is my favorite. Um, it was also my mother's favorite book. And maybe I'm biased because of that. But this book, it is just so, um, I don't want to overuse the word beautiful, but it, it really, I think the prose uh, is so, is deceptively simple, but really, you know, as we'll see, just um, really, really emotive and specific and memorable. Um, there's nothing really violent or dark about this one. There is some drama, but it's nothing to give you nightmares about. <laughs> so um, that's that. All right. So, um, oh yeah, but one, one thing that's interesting to compare, if you end up reading The Memory Police at any time, something you'll notice is that both of these books deal with human memory, but in slightly different ways. You can tell that the author having written 50 or so books, uh, she is interested in a lot of things, but I think one of those um, common threads is her interest in human memory, the possibilities, like how is one human able to recite the largest prime number off the top of his head, you know, and like, she's really interested in, um, in, in the ability of people's memories, but also its limitations and how fallible we all are. And um, she's also interest, very interested in math in this one because you know the professor is a math professor. And um, you know, if you start getting really digging deep into it, I feel like you can kind of notice her interest in numbers in some of her other works as well. So just something to watch out for. Um, for the housekeeper and the professor, uh, it's, I'm not sure if, if, if you read into this, but there are exactly 11 chapters and that is another prime number. Not sure if that was intentional, but you know, I, I, as I was preparing, I just couldn't help but notice all of these things. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and here we are. Uh, this is the first page of The Housekeeper and the Professor. And what I wanted to do was during this session, um, there's so much that happens in this first chapter in the opening. And I think, um, you know, by studying the opening, we can study what the writer has set out to do for the rest of the novel. And um, hopefully for those who are logging in here or watching this later who have not read the book, I hope that this entices you to keep reading. And then after looking at this first chapter, we'll skip forward a little bit to look at a passage that features cherry blossoms, and then skipping ahead just a little bit again to talk about the way she handles math in her novel. And then after that, I think I'll open it up for just general discussions. But if anybody has any thoughts or questions, um, yeah, feel free to unmute and speak. But I think we'll just start reading and discussing. Um, 
Can I, 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 I might call on some volunteers <laughs> to read aloud here. Like I said, I don't wanna just have the session be my voice. So um, Ginger or Reina, can I have either one of you um, start as a volunteer? Oh, Ginger, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yes, I'll start. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, we called him the professor, he, and he called my son Root because he said the flat top of his head reminded him of the square root sign. There's a fine brain in there, the professor said, messing my son's hair. Root, who wore a cap to avoid being teased by his friends, gave a wary shrug. With this one little sign, we can come to know an infinite range of numbers, even though we can't see, those we can't see. He traced the symbol in the thick layer of dusk on his desk. Thank you. We'll just pause there for a second. Um, I want us to notice how she is beginning the book in the middle of her already being employed by the professor and being in their house. And she's also just in that first opening already including her son. And throughout this novel, she will be referred to as Root, uh, the nickname. We never, uh, at no point in this book uh, does the novelist reveal any of their real names. So the housekeeper, she is writing this in first person. We never hear anybody refer to her by name. Root is Root, and the professor is the professor. Uh, so no names given. And uh, that is an interesting creative choice. A lot of the times I feel like novels, they really pick and choose. And for example, Haruki Murakami chooses a lot of weird, unique names that you would never hear in real life. And um, <laughs> you know, uh, this is kind of the polar opposite of that. And um, there's some who say perhaps by not naming them, uh, it is one way to make the characters closer and more relatable regardless of your background or, you know, whether you're Japanese or not. Um, the professor is the professor, housekeeper is housekeeper. You can kind of fill in the gaps in your head that way. Um, I, I just wanted to check if everybody, at least here, understands the, the root <laughs> sign with respect to the head. So in the film adaptation, it's really funny. Um, they give this, like, you know, he's already a grown up and he's a teacher, but they give him the actor like they 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 make a part of his hair stick up a little bit like this. And uh, even his students nickname him Root and he embraces that. And um, you can just imagine my my five year old son also has hair like this. He just mm -hmm. always wakes up with a tiny bit of hair just sticking up like this. And so when I see this description, it's just really poignant. But um, just wanted to make sure that 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 made sense for everybody that uh, that that symbol is showing the the little the little curl in the hair. Mm -hmm. um, any any other thoughts or questions before we move on? All right, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit and let's see. Uh, Ginger, would you mind uh, continuing to read just a little bit from this opening starting, again? Starting at the top of all? Yes, please. Of all the countless things my son and I learned from the professor, the meaning of the square root was among the most important. No doubt he would have been bothered by my use of the word countless, too sloppy, for he believed that the very origins of the universe could be explained in the exact language of numbers, but I don't know how else to put it. He taught us about enormous prime numbers with more than 100,000 places, and the largest number of all, which was used in mathematical proofs and was in the Guinness Book of, World Re Guinness Book of Records, and about the idea of something beyond infinity. As interesting as all this was, it could never match the experience of sp simply spending time with the professor. I remember when he taught us about the spell cast by placing numbers under this square root sign. It was a rainy evening in early April. My son's school bag lay abandoned on the rug. The light in the professor's study was dim. Outside the window, the blossoms on the apricot tree were heavy with rain. The professor never really seemed to care about whether we figured out the right answer to a problem. He preferred our wild, desperate guesses to silence. And he was even more delighted when those guesses led to new problems that took us beyond the original one. 
He had a special feeling for what he called the correct miscalculation, for he believed that mistakes were often as revealing as the right answers. This gave us confidence even when our best efforts came to nothing. Then what happens if you take the square root of negative one, he asked. So you'd need to get negative one by multiplying a number by itself, Root asked. He had just learned fractions at school and it had taken a half hour lecture from the professor to convince him that numbers less than zero even existed. So this was quite a leap. We tried picturing the square root of negative one in our heads. The square root of 100 is 10. The square root of 16 is four. The square root of one is one. So the square root of negative one is. He didn't press us. On the contrary, he fondly studied our expressions as we mulled over the problem. There is no such number, I said at last, sounding rather tentative. Yes, there is, he said, pointing at his chest. It's in here. It's the most discreet sort of number, so it never comes out where it can be seen, but it's here. We fell silent for a moment, trying to picture the square root of minus one in some distant, unknown place. The only sound was the rain falling outside the window. My son ran his, head, his hand over his head as if to confirm the shape of the square root symbol. But the professor didn't always insist on being the teacher. He had enormous respect for matters about which he had no knowledge. And he was as humble in such cases as the square root of negative one itself. Whenever he needed my help, he would interrupt me in the most polite way. Even the simplest request that I help him set the timer on the toaster, for example, had always begun, began with, I'm terribly sorry to bother you, but once I'd set the dial, he would sit peering in as the toast browned. He was as fascinated by the toast as he was by the mathematical proofs we did together, as if the truth of the toaster were no different from that of the Pythagorean theorem. Thank you so much for reading, Ginger. We'll pause there for just a second. So those are the first three pages, the opening of this novel. And um, a few things to point out. Um, there's, you know, this book, I, I think Andrea actually mentioned this um, earlier, but you know, I, in some ways, this book can seem intimidating, because, you know, even on the cover, you'll see a little faint mathematical signs like pi and e and plus and minus, whatever. And, you know, as soon as we learn that the professor is a math professor, and even flipping through the book, you'll see um, some of the pages are filled with with formulas or them trying to figure out a formula, and it can seem a little intimidating. Um, I will also say that um, I you know, uh, I, I grew up um, a little bit in the Japanese school system where they made us memorize math, like multiplications. We, you, you weren't supposed to really think about it. You were just supposed to memorize, like, um, as opposed to, I think, in the American math system, you're supposed to show your work and show that you understand every single formula. And for me, um, having grown up with both cultures, I, I always felt like math was just so hard. <laughs> Even memorizing was really hard. It made no sense. And then when you had to think about it so hard and show your work, I just, I felt like it was such a chore. And um, probably one of the reasons why I turned to the humanities and literature, because it made a little more sense to me. But this book, it, um, it is at times very much about math and the professor's love of math, but it is also, as you can see in this opening section, they're talking about the square root of negative one. Uh, that is a math problem, but it is also not a ma about math. This is about the professor and how unique he is and the way that he is so patient and the way that he allows, you know, the housekeeper and her son to mull this over um, you know, and she also throughout, uh, focuses a lot on the sensory details. There's rain, there's the apricot tree, there's lots of sounds and you can, um, it, it feels very quiet, but really intricately drawn. So th the book on the one hand is about math and on, on the other hand, not at all about math. She's using math to talk about these humans and their relationship. And um, that's what I find so appealing about this. It actually makes me want to learn math. <laughs> it actually makes me excited uh, to one day, you know, when my sons are old enough to have problems like these to, you know, I, I would love to 
um, tell them like, oh, the, the answer to the square root of negative one is in here. I, I want to see how they react to that. But um, I just think it's just such a, uh, it, it, it sets up a very warm, compassionate tone for the rest of the book. Usually great writers will set up these sort of rules in the beginning for how to read the rest of the book. Um, I know we've talked about this in other novels that and, and short stories that we've discussed for reading between the lines. But here, I think this is a great example of Yoko Ogawa, a very seasoned, talented writer setting this up to say, um, this book is about the relationship between these three key people. And there will be some math, but it will also, you will also, even if you skip over that, you can still appreciate the sensory details, you can appreciate the other human elements. So that's something. Um, and we're going to skip forward a little bit. I believe the next pages on my notes, um, I wanted to, us to turn our attention to page six. Um, between pages six to nine, we get uh, the author really introduces us to her, um, the way she came to work for this house and her first interaction with the professor. Uh, you can tell that even from the beginning, we're jumping a little tiny bit in time. Like at first we're in the setting where she's already working for him. And then we backtrack a little bit just to, uh, just to be shown how she came to this job, how, how she even became to be a housekeeper. And just a little um, summary for those who are coming to this novel for the first time, the housekeeper, she is, um, she is a young single mother. Her son is about 10 and she, you know, got pregnant very early, like in her early twenties. And um, the, the father was pretty much non-existent. And so she was forced to raise him all on her own. And she was also raised by a single mother. And they, um, the, the only real skill that she had to support her and her son was housekeeping. So she's been, she's been a housekeeper for, for, for as long as she's been a parent. And um, she describes it as pretty matter of fact, but also uh, we can tell that this job that she gets with the professor, this, this one stands out um, for many reasons, but this is, you know, on around page six, I believe um, is when we see her coming to this house. And um, another little quick overview about the professor's situation. So he lives in this little cottage uh, that's separate from the main house where his sister-in-law lives. Her sister-in-law is a widow. So they're, you know, very much just lonely, solitary people. And we will, um, I believe, was this already introduced before? Yes. So on page five, and we weren't going to look at this excerpt because there's a lot more that we can look at, but a big non-spoiler because she talks about this on page five, the professor's memory only lasts 80 minutes due to a car accident that happened a few decades ago. So the way his brain works is that he's a brilliant mathematician and he remembers math, but he doesn't remember any life events following the accident. He just keeps, his brain keeps repeating the same day over and over 80 minutes at a time. And so the housekeeper um, has to introduce herself to the professor every, every time, every 80 minutes. And the sister-in-law who employs her, she is explaining that in the previous pages. But here on page six, this is the first time the housekeeper interacts with the professor. Um, can I have a volunteer just read aloud from this part on page six, starting with compared to... Andrea, can I call on you? Okay, if I know how to unmute myself. <laughs> oh, you are already unmuted. It's okay. okay. You can just, yeah, okay. <laughs> just a little bit. So start with compared to the impressive main house, the cottage was modest to the point of being shabby. A small bungalow that seemed to have been built hastily 
trees and shrubs had gone wild around it, and the doorway was deep in shadows. When I tried the doorbell on Monday, it seemed to be broken. What's your shoe size? This was the professor's first question. Once I had announced myself as a new housekeeper, no bow, no greeting. If there is one ironclad rule in my profession is that you always give the employer what he wants. So I told him 24 centimeters. That's a sturdy number, he said. It's a factorial of four. He folded his arms, closed his eyes and was silent for a moment. What's a factorial, I asked at last. I felt I should try to find out a bit more since it seemed to be connected to his interest in my shoe size. The product of all the natural numbers from one to four is 24, he said without opening his eyes. What's your telephone number? He nodded as if deeply impressed. That's the total number of primes between one and 100 million. It wasn't immediately clear to me why my phone number was so interesting, but his enthusiasm seemed genuine and he wasn't showing off. He struck me as straightforward and modest. He, he nearly convinced, it nearly convinced me that there was something special about my phone number so that I was somehow special for having it. Soon after I began working for the professor, I realized that he talked about numbers whenever he was unsure of what to say or do. Numbers were, all, numbers were also his way of reaching out to the world. They were safe, a source of comfort. Every morning during the entire time I worked for the professor, we repeated this numerical Q&A at the front door to the professor whose memory lasted only 80 minutes. I was always a new housekeeper. He was meeting for the first time. And so every morning he was appropriately shy and reserved. He would ask my shoe size or telephone number or perhaps my zip code, the registration number on my bicycle or the number of brush strokes in the character of my name. And whatever the number, he invariably found some significance in it. Talk of factorials, and primes flowed effortlessly, seeming completely natural, never forced. Later, even after I had learned the meaning of some of these terms, there was something pleasant about our daily introductions at the house. I found it reassuring to be reminded that my telephone number had some significance beyond its usual purpose, and the simple sound of the numbers helped me to start the day's work with a positive attitude. Let's pause there for a second. Um, a couple other details that you know he, uh, is mentioned slightly later. He is 64 years old, but he looked older. Um, and he always wears a suit and tie. Andrea, would you mind reading again from the bottom of page eight, starting with, but by far. But by far the most curious thing about the professor's appearance was the fact that his suit was covered with innumerable scraps of note paper, each one attached to him by a tiny binder clip. Every conceivable surface, the collar, cuffs, pockets, hems, belt loops, and buttonholes were covered with notes. And the binder clips gathered the fabric of his clothing in awkward. The notes were simply scraps of torn paper, some yellowing or crumbling. In order to read them, you had to get close and squint, but it soon became clear that he was compensating for his lack of memory by writing down things he absolutely had to remember and pinning them where he couldn't lose them on his body. His odd appearance was as distracting as his questions about my shoe size. Thank you for reading. I'll okay. pause there for a second. Um, so yeah, I, this this is another passage I just absolutely love. Um, we get all of these details about the professor um, and this is her first interaction, but as um, we talked about, this is an interaction that happens over and over for him, but for her, it becomes this layered you know, experience um, every time she's saying the same things, but she's also getting to know him a little bit better. And these little quirks about him, um, aside from his passion for numbers, his fascination with 
all kinds of ran seemingly random numbers. The fact that he wears a suit and tie, just like he used to do as a professor, probably. And he has to have all of these sticky notes or just notes, um, it seems, uh, attached to him. Yeah, by a binder clip. And um, this is also just really charmingly portrayed in the film adaptation too. Um, he just is covered in these notes. And um, and the, this plays an important part of the plot as the novel moves on. Sometimes he'll add new things like um, he'll put a reminder about a new housekeeper or her son or little things. Um, but the one that remains constant is a note that says your memory only lasts 80 minutes. Um, let's see. I want to maybe skip ahead just a little bit more to pages 16. This is still in that first chapter, I believe, or at least in the opening. Um, I'm going to skip forward on my screen here. Da, 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 da page 16, 17, this is where we get a little fun interaction between the housekeeper and professor where they're doing the similar exchange, right, where they're talking about numbers, but this is where they, uh, or where, where the professor realizes that they have an important connection, because uh, he asks her, like, when is your birthday? And she says, um, February 20th. And he says, your birthday is February 20th. This is sort of in the middle of page 16. I'll just read a little bit and summarize uh, before we move on to a slightly longer section. Um, but here, um, just in my margin notes, I put the number 220. <laughs> and uh, you can even see on page 17, the novelist, she has placed these numbers across from each other like that too. But her birthday is 220. And then he says, uh, you know, that there's this number on his watch, um, this prize that he won for writing this thesis. And um, on the wristwatch, it says uh, he won the prize number 284. And he immediately notices this relationship between 220 and 284, which is as she, as the novelist puts up at the top of page 17, um, at first, you know, the, the housekeeper who, uh, this is another thing I wanted to notice that the housekeeper is a stand in for most of the readers who probably know a little bit of math, but like me, probably, you know, if you're reading literature, <laughs> maybe you weren't so good at math. Like I, may, maybe there's people who are good at math and reading literature, but you know, it's, it's assumed that, um, she, the housekeeper is a stand in for the readers. And so the housekeeper is able to ask questions like, um, like what, what does this mean? Or, um, can you explain that to me? And then she can have the professor explain to her, but also directly to the reader. So it's a convenient little stand in as a character choice. But anyway, she, you know, puts these numbers together and he has the, has the uh, professor explain throughout the section that, uh, Oh, and this is this is another charming part. She's trying to figure it out. She's like, well, 220 grams of meat is not that different from 284 grams of meat. She's thinking um, from her world. And he says, good. Like he encourages her. He says that's, you know, he, he doesn't berate her or say that's not a mathematical way of thinking. It's okay to look at numbers intuitively. And, she, you know, he keeps encouraging her and, and then they get into, okay, what is a factor? What is a amicable number and so they spell it out you don't have to we don't have to read the whole thing here but basically they together they work through this problem or more like the relationship between these two numbers and very conveniently maybe in a literary sense 220 and 284 are amicable numbers and um this is a, a thing that especially for the housekeeper it makes her feel special and, you know, this is not just any job to her anymore. This is someone who, um, who she, she is going to care about. And in turn, just because, you know, like I said, the housekeeper is also a convenient stand-in for her, for the readers of this book. We, in turn, as readers, we start to care a lot about this professor whose memory only lasts 80 minutes. And um, 
I think it's also interesting to have a choice of this character who is so brilliant but helpless. Like he still needs someone to take care of him and make meals and clean up. And um, how lucky in a way that they matched, right? That that out of um, another thing to notice that this isn't his first housekeeper. He's had other housekeepers before, but they all left <laughs> because they couldn't stand him, or they couldn't, you know, um, they they found his quirks to be a little bit much. And uh, throughout the book, I don't want to give major spoilers, but there is a moment where um, something happens and her employment is at stake. But, um, you know, from the very opening of this book, by page 19, if you're not invested in this relationship, in, this, in th these amicable um, people, well, I don't know. I feel like the, the writing does so much work here to make you care. And this is a great example of a writer making readers care about characters. So uh, before we move on to a, a slightly later section, does anybody have any questions or comments about uh, about the opening of the housekeeper and professor so far. All right, I'm going to share my screen again, and um, you know, don't be shy if you if you have any. There's no such thing as a bad question <laughs> or a thought. So if you ever have anything that you'd like to share, uh, please feel free to unmute and speak. The next excerpt I'd like us to look at is on page 40, 40. And let me scroll down here. This is in the beginning of chapter three. Um, as much as I'd love to dissect so much of chapter two, we're just gonna skip ahead because this is one of the reasons I chose this book. Uh, as you'll see from the underlines that I've made on page 41, this is the part where we get the mention of the cherry blossoms. So um, could I have another volunteer read out loud from page 40 from I Finally Managed? I finally managed to get the professor out of the house. Since I'd come to work, he had not so much as set foot in the garden, let alone gone for a real outing, and I thought some fresh air would be good for him. It's beautiful outside today, I said, coaxing him. It makes you want to go out, get some sun. The professor was ensconced in his easy chair with a book. Why don't we take a walk? in the park and then stop in at the barber shop. And why would we do that? He said, glancing up at me over his reading glasses. No particular reason. The cherry blossoms are just over in the park and the dogwood is about to bloom and a haircut might feel good. I feel fine like this. A walk would get your circulation going and that might help you come up with some good ideas for your formulas. There's no connection between the arteries in the legs and the ones in the head. Well, you'd be much handsomer if you took care of your hair. Waste of time, he said, but eventually my persistence got the better of him and he closed his book. The only shoes in the cupboard by the door were old leather ones covered in a thin layer of mold. You'll stay with me, he asked several times as I was cleaning them off. You can't just leave me while I'm having my hair cut and come home. Don't worry, I'll stay with you the whole time. No matter how much I polish these shoes, we're still dull. If I wasn't sure what to do with the notes the professor had clipped all over his body, if we left them on, people were bound to stare. But since he didn't seem to care, I decided to leave them alone. The professor marched along, staring down at his feet without a glance at the blue sky overhead or the sights we passed along the way. The walk did not seem to relax him. He was more tense than usual. Look, 
I'd say the cherry blossoms are in full bloom. But he only muttered to himself. Out in the open air, he seemed somehow older. We decided to go to the barber shop first. The barber recalled at the sight of the professor's strange suit, but he turned out to be a kind man. He realized quickly that there must be a reason for the notes. And after that, he treated the professor like any other customer. You're lucky to have your daughter with you, he said assuming we were related. Neither of us corrected him. I sat on the sofa with the men waiting in line for their haircuts. You want me to read on? Um, actually, yeah, let's, um, let's skip forward a little bit. If you could um, read from uh, around the bottom of page 42, this is starting with the white clippings of hair. Yes, the white clippings of hair fell in clumps on the cape and then scattered to the floor. As he cut and combed away, did the barber suspect that the brain inside this snowy head could list all the prime numbers up to a hundred million? And did the customers on the sofa waiting impatiently for the strange old man to depart, have any notion of the special bond between my birthday and the professor's wristwatch. For some reason, I felt a secret pride in knowing these things, and I smiled at the professor just a bit more brightly in the mirror. After the barber shop, we sat on a bench in the park and drank a can of coffee. There was a sandbox nearby and a fountain and some tennis courts. When the wind blew, the petals from the cherry trees floated around us and the dappled sunlight danced on the professor's face. The notes on his jacket fluttered restlessly and he stared down into the can as if he had been given some mysterious portion. Thank you. We can just pause there. Mm -hmm. um, what a beautiful passage here about not just their relationship, but their relationship with their surroundings. This is one of the first times we see them out and about outside the house. This feels like an important move in the novel where you know, um, a different writer might have just written this book entirely uh, set inside the house, but I like how Yoko Ogawa um, is choosing to to place them in different scenarios so that it's never um, it's never really static. It's always slightly different, and depending on where uh, we see the professor, her view of him shifts too. And so, by seeing him in the context of like the public world and uh, reminding herself that his appearance, which she's probably used to at this point, she's reminded that all of the notes around his suit and his quirks, like asking everybody, what's your shoe size? Like all of that's going to seem really, really strange for people who don't know him. But, um, you know, she also talks about the secret pride she feels in their amicable numbers, the fact that she knows so much about him and um, the other thing, I, I just could not help but underline these sentences, um, especially at the top of page 43. I, I just can't think of a more beautiful description of cherry blossoms in literature like this, um, the, the way that she incorporates that scenery and how the notes on his jacket fluttered restlessly. There's something so poignant and just... Um, the other thing to note about cherry blossoms too, and I wonder um, now that I'm thinking out loud, uh, cherry blossoms are a very temporary phenomenon. When they bloom, they usually only bloom for a, a week, maybe two if it's good weather. But uh, this is just something that, um, you know, cherry blossom trees as part of an, a long history in Japanese agriculture and the natural scenery, Japanese people 
um, know this about cherry blossoms, how temporal they are, how fleeting their beauty is, and how people will schedule uh, what's called hanami, but it's an occasion where you get together with friends and lay out a tarp on the on the grass under a cherry blossom and you drink and you eat and you gather and it's it only happens for like one weekend if you're lucky and it is such a gorgeous phenomenon most parks in Japan will allow people to drink in the open for hanami and uh, because they they see this as an important cultural moment and um, now that, yeah, like I said, now that I'm thinking out loud, I wonder if the temporality of cherry blossoms, the fact that it only lasts a little bit, it is a really interesting thing to put um, in juxtaposition with the professor's very, very fleeting memory, right, where it's 80 minutes over and over. But um, yeah, that's something that I just noticed. Maybe that was more obvious to other readers, <laughs> but I'm just noticing it now. The fleetingness of, of cherry blossoms together with the fleetingness of this memory. But um, I really wanted to show that to you. I, I feel like we couldn't have done this reading between the lines without looking at that section. We couldn't have justified doing this during cherry blossom week. So um, before we move on to, to I, I, I just have one um, more excerpt that I thought we could look at, but does anybody have any thoughts or reflections or questions about the parts we've looked at so far? Well, um, if you are in a city like Nashville that has cherry blossoms, I encourage you to um, go out in the next day or so and notice um, notice the petals, notice the the colors, how it interacts with the wind. Think back to this passage, and hopefully you'll come to a renewed appreciation of that. Um, all right, skipping forward a little bit again, I wanted to show a little bit of um, you know just the way that Yoko Ogawa, the novelist, deals with math in this book, but in a very approachable way. Um, here on page 60, this is beginning of chapter four. Here she is talking about the professor's love of prime numbers. Uh, prime numbers, like I said in the beginning, it plays a very important role throughout this book. And um, this is uh, the opening of this chapter is where she mentions um you know the professor's love for it. and I, I'll just read a few few parts here um so the professor loved prime numbers more than anything in the world I'd been vaguely aware of their existence but it never occurred to me that they could be the object of someone's deepest affection he was tender and attentive and respectful by turns he would caress them or prostrate himself before them he never strayed far from his prime numbers whether at his desk or at the dinner table, when he talked about numbers, primes were most likely to make an appearance. At first, it was hard to see their appeal. They seemed so stubborn, resisting division by any number but one and themselves. Still, as we were swept up in the professor's enthusiasm, we gradually came to understand his devotion, and the primes began to seem more real, as though we could reach out and touch them. I'm sure they meant something different to each of us, but as soon as the professor would mention prime numbers, we would look at each other with conspiratorial smiles. Just as the thought of a caramel can cause your mouth to water, the mere mention of prime numbers made us anxious to know more about their secrets. Um, one thing I really love about Ogawa's use of numbers and pr the professor's love of numbers is um, these uh, phrases she uses, like the 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 caramel in your mouth. Um, even if you, even after reading this book, even if you end up not appreciating or loving math as much, I think you can still appreciate someone else's love for it. And this is a great description of someone else's passion. And um, another thing that is so cool, I guess, um, not a lot of novels really um, play around with math or um, these non-literary things, but um, you know, and th this is going to sound really obvious, but I'll just say it: the that math, math, math is a universal language, 
right? Regardless of where you're from, regardless of your cultural background, um, you you can still if if you if you know math, you can you can have a conversation. You can look at a formula and try to solve that problem together. There is something universal about math. And the other thing that in, other interesting thing she brings into this novel a little later on, and then it plays an even bigger role in the plot is the way she uses baseball as a similar universal kind of cultural language. Um, so Root, the son, he is a huge fan of the Hanshin Tigers. That is a big um baseball team uh very historic it's sort of like you know in america i think you have like the yankees and the red Sox, and in japan you're either like a giants fan or a tigers fan <laughs> it's it's really that uh it, people are all in for either one of those teams and the hanshin tigers um is Root's favorite team. It also happens to be the professor's, but because his the professor's memory is so fleeting and it has stopped in the, you know, decades ago, his memory of the baseball team, you know, he, he remembers who the pitcher was, but obviously in the present day when this novel takes place, the pitcher no longer is the same. And, um, you know, so th that's an interesting way of dealing with something universal that still has evolved a little bit and the housekeeper and the son has to take into that take that into account every time they talk about baseball around him they have to make sure they're not shocking him too much with these details but um that is something to watch out for throughout this novel is um you know how math and baseball how you know they they might seem like two very different things but they they are in fact very related and the professor's love for math also translates into his love of baseball. I don't know if anybody in here has seen the film Moneyball or read the book by Michael Lewis, but that was a book about statisticians who uh, who analyze baseball using math and with statistics and with, you know, they try to game the system. And um, it's one of my husband's favorite movies, so I've been forced to watch it many times. But <laughs> um, Moneyball, in Moneyball, they also talk about the relationship between numbers and baseball. Um, and, you know, that sort of um, push and pull between something that is romanticized, something that is very emotional for, you know, people can get really emotional about baseball. Like you could um, have a favorite player or you could have a favorite game or you could be thinking about a game in relation to something important in your life um, but a mathematician might look at the same game and appreciate it but in a different way so that's their relationship too in this novel between root and the professor and um, it's just such a beautiful thing that unfolds throughout and um, just like just like you end up appreciating math or people who appreciate math you end up appreciating um, appreciating baseball, uh, too, a little bit. So, um, she, you know, throughout this book, she ties in a lot of different, um, ideas, themes, and, um, yeah, I think those are, those were the only, um, excerpts that I, I had planned for our session tonight, but, um, you know, before we end, I wanted to just open it up uh, to see if anybody had any, and I know we have a bit of an intimate group this time, but uh, if anybody had any additional thoughts or questions about, about this novel while we're still together. I really want to know yeah. about the <clears throat> sister-in-law and their relationship. Uh, Does anybody figure that out? Yeah, I, um, so, you know, <laughs> there is there is a section that talks about how, so as we talked about the, the professor's head injury, the brain injury came from that accident and the sister-in-law is seen with a cane. And mm -hmm. at a certain point, the housekeeper um, ends up finding the news article that details the accident. And she finds that actually the sister-in-law was in the same car and that's right. why she has the cane. And yeah, I, I think the novelist never explicitly um reveals what happened but it's probably because we're still in that housekeeper's perspective the whole time like it's not an omniscient third person we're just in the housekeeper's head so whatever she knows we know and 
I don't think she ever finds that out, but that is, yeah, I, I was really curious about that too. I, I think some, I think they were romantically involved, but you know, that's me that wanting to be romantic. That notation in the thesis she found. Remember the notation? Yes, there was a notation. Yeah. That was something like, I think, eternal. I believe this was, she, he used the word eternal, like yeah. for my eternal one or eternal love. And she, the housekeeper knows that for a mathematician, the word eternal has to mean something just extreme. Like it's not a casual way we would throw around the word eternal for him. Yeah. So and we don't know if it was mutual or one-sided, right? Like it's, it, that's never really clear. Um, yeah, it is interesting too that they live in different houses. Right. <clears throat> I, yeah. I just thought it was fun that she had to throw in some romance. Um, in the film adaptation, it's interesting because the, in, in the book, the reveal <laughs> about you know, the fact that they were in the same car during the accident, that happens a lot later. And in the film, the uh, the sister-in-law writes out, like she says it in the first introduction. She's like, um, she just reveals that information. Like, oh, my leg is bad because of the same oh. accident. And I, I was a little thrown off by that actually, by the adaptation part of it. Like, I think that that's a juicy thing to reveal later, but anyway. <laughs> It certainly added layers, didn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, the mystery of it. Uh, Reina, did you have a thought or question? Yeah, I had a thought. I remember one um, couple I met 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, and they, are, they were mathematics teacher in high school. And I think I went to gathering, some gathering, and there was a couple and their friend. And their friend told me that whose husband and wife, they start dating in college. And, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have a smartphone, like a text message. So they exchanged like notes or letters. How they communicated is where the mathematical formula was science. <laughs> I was so amazed that, but those mathematicians, well, they, that's great. <laughs> okay, yes, even they, you know, show their love. <laughs> I love yeah. that. And yeah, that's, that's very good. similar to the professor in this book. Um, yes. There's one point in the book where he pretty much resolves a conflict by writing a formula, you know, and the sister-in-law sees it and she just lets go of her anger. And it's almost like a secret code. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just so fascinating. I, I think there was another thing that came to mind as I reread this was that movie that, you know, from <laughs> a while back, uh, The Beautiful Mind, yeah. you know, the, the one that won the um, really good. Academy Awards, and it, it's it's based on the life of John Nash, mm -hmm. but right. um, it also made me think of that and how the life of a eccentric mathematician is portrayed. Um, this professor, you know, he's not a he's not schizophrenic like John Nash. So it's not that extreme, but even just the, in a place like Japan, if you're, you know, um, out and about with, with notes around your suit and, you know, just like that scene we looked at, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna signal, um, a lot of like otherness. Um, and I think that's, yeah. Um, it's interesting to contrast the portrayals. Ginger, did you have a thought? Yeah, it's just I hadn't thought about what you said that that we only know what the housekeeper knows um, because it's so that is that does lead a lot of things kind of up to your imagination, like the re relationship with the sister in law. And I think that's kind of uh, interesting, uh, too, so that it's not all written that we can sort of imagine to ourselves, you know, some things because, um, you know, we're only we only know what she knows. That's right. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, this is a work of fiction. So Yoko Ogawa is deliberately not, you know, mm -hmm. deliberately choosing that and deliberately choosing not to re reveal all this. And maybe she has an idea in her head yeah, of right, right. Yeah. what really there, happened. Yeah, I guess there are enough hints that you kind of, yeah, thank you. No, but yeah, I thought this, the adding the sister in law in was really interesting part of it, even though we, too, even though we didn't don't find out all the details, it was still interesting to add that part of it to the story. Yeah. 
other thoughts or questions? I think I was flabbergasted that the housekeeper and the 10 year old were not mortified to be seen with someone as eccentric looking as he was. I was sort of proud of them. I thought they really, you know, <laughs> showed incredible bravery. I mean, I, even today, I don't know if I want to go out with someone, <laughs> you know, and I'm barely mature. <laughs> I thought that was just a wonderful window into acceptance. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think even in that very first encounter, you know, the housekeeper is noticing all of his quirks, but she's playing along, you know, and understanding that she does have to repeat this Q&A over and over. She doesn't, she's never mean about it. Like, I feel like, you know, any other, maybe this happened with the previous housekeepers that they might've taken advantage of the fact that his memory doesn't last so long. Um, but it seems, at least from, you know, um, my perspective of the book, I, you get the sense that she was kind to him, no matter what, mm -hmm. like, even if she knew he was going to forget. And yeah, that is definitely an interesting way to model a relationship. And this is such a unique relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it doesn't evolve into anything romantic or um, they, they really are. The, this is just a, a, about a, a true friendship amongst unlikely people and um there's something really beautiful about that i think she does not to be too practical about it but she does need the job right so you know so she yes will put up with some things like we all have to do sometimes in, in our jobs but um but yet she does she is does seem like a kind person that you know doesn't seem to resent having to put up with those eccentricities so yeah mm -hmm. And, you know, um, there, there's another, you know, uh, one of the other things to love about this book is um, when the housekeeper sees the professor's affection for Root um, cool. every time they meet how he embraces him and rustles his mm -hmm. unruly hair and the way he is so protective of the boy, mm -hmm. even though um, I think there is uh, two contrasting scenes. There's um, when the housekeeper is just alone with the professor and they're eating dinner. He's very sloppy with the food and she's kind of not judgmental, but just feeling like, oh, he's just he doesn't care about decorum or, you know, table manners. And then as soon as Root enters the scene, if he's there to have dinner, the professor will tighten up a little bit and doesn't slurp and tries to be a good role model. Um, and that was an interesting, you know, just a uh, uh, display of, of his particular affection. And maybe even that's another, I think, source of mystery for me. Like, why, why did he want to protect this boy so much what happened in his childhood or mm -hmm. you know, um maybe he had a very affectionate mother or father that he was modeling off of but um yeah there's so much that is left unsaid mm -hmm. but it's not um they're they're not like even if you don't know I think you can still come away um appreciating what you know the short novel does accomplish and yeah all right um any other burning thoughts or questions before we we end the session and i also want to move um my mic to ginger who will have a couple of things to say about about um upcoming jast events but uh, i just want to give that opportunity in case anybody had a burning thought well thank you all so much uh, for for joining for watching uh, this has some, been such a pleasure and um, and ginger yeah if, uh, I know that you had some things uh, that you wanted to mention about about Japan week well yeah first just to thank you you're so great and love listening to you talk about the books that really makes me want to go back and read that book again I really enjoyed it the first time I was called read it again it was really good so thanks Yurina thanks very much thanks to everybody for joining and we will have a recording on our on the jazz youtube channel um so you can go back and listen again and for those who weren't able to join us um tonight can can listen to it 
too. And yeah, we just said we have our biggest event probably of the year coming up on Saturday, the National Cherry Blossom Festival. We had last year 40,000 people attend. So it was a great, great day. It was actually a little chilly. So we're, so it's going to be quite a bit warmer on Saturday. And hopefully that rain that's supposed to come will wait until Saturday night. We hope. Um, so it should be a nice day outside. So we're looking forward to, to being with everybody downtown Nashville at the National Cherry Blossom Festival. So Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks, Sharina. Thanks for everything. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Stay very tuned for our next. Um, stay tuned for our next reading between the lines. We'll let Irina decide um, what book and uh, pick a date. So we'll we'll put out that as soon as we know. <laughs> okay. I look you. forward to it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.